Okay, hopefully you can all hear us well. We've been working to try to get our set up so that we could be outdoors and go ahead and start back and doing live programs. Hopefully you got a copy of our 2021 program guide. Did everybody get one of those? We have one on the, have them on the table over here if you did not get one. Um, all of our programs are registered through agriplex.org. It really helps us if you pre-register. Some of our programs are limited registration, like we have a barn quilt painting class that is already full. Our goat program on Saturday is already full, so we can't take people at the door for those. So we buy supplies for some of them. Some of them have just class limits, so it helps us a lot if you'll go ahead and register on the website. If you have problems registering, we have an iPad in here, and you can come and do it in person, or if you want to call us, we can help you do it over the phone. Um, or if you want to, you know, stop by, just let us know and we'll help you. Because I know it's not the easiest thing in the world. I apologize for that. But it sure helps us a lot. Um, let's see. So programs coming up in March. We are still this month doing a Zoom for our Lunch and Learn program. And that is going to be pruning ornamentals. We've said that Tony Glover's doing it. But actually, Rhonda Britton, who is also with Extension, will be uh, leading that class for us. And that is on Wednesday, March 17th, St. Patrick's Day at noon. So that'll be Zoom. We'll also do it Facebook Live. We've learned a little bit over this year. Now we know that we can, um, when our Zoom class fills up, we can put it on Facebook Live and everybody can see us. So we're learning. Um, so thank you for being patient with us. Tonight we're going to cover basics um, of growing backyard chickens. Landon and I were just talking about we did this program in July of 2019. So we were going strong then. Um, but we're glad to be able to offer it because I know a lot of people have a lot of interest in backyard chickens. We've been teaching backyard chickens since we got started programming here in 2012. So I introduced myself. My name is Rachel Dossie. I'm the director here. But I'm also a backyard chicken enthusiast. So we um, moved up to Illinois when I was, gosh, I don't remember how old I was, but it was in um, 2003, I think. And we had some friends who were interested in backyard birds. We were in an urban area, and we got started with the backyard chicken effort in 2004. And so we've had chickens ever since. They've moved with us from here to there to there to here. Um, and we've had some favorite pets. And so I'm just going to kind of tell you about our experience. How many of you guys already have chickens? I know I've talked to several of you that do. And so I'm going to kind of just give basics of raising them, keeping predators from getting them. And then Landon, he's the scientist, and he's going to tell you about nutrition and disease and prevention from the extension side. So um, hopefully we'll answer your questions. Please, at any time, raise your hand, wave at us, and let us know. Okay, I got my packet. Who else needs a packet? Raise your hand. And thank you, Jerry Thompson. Jerry usually does cattle, but he's here to learn more about uh, chickens tonight. So he works with the extension as well. Who else needs a packet? Do y'all need one more? Yeah, one more over here. Okay. okay, thanks. I introduced you, Landon, already. <laughs> so I tell them I'm going to do the basics, and then you're going to cover all the science part, nutrition, and everything else. <laughs> um, and I have to tell you one thing. I ordered chicks for this class, and I spent a long time ordering chicks because I don't know if any of you tried to get chicks lately, but they are hard to come by right now. I know Chambers has some now. But I wanted to get specific egg layers because some of my last chickens um, that y'all know about are their big brahmas. And they're beautiful chickens, but they've not been good egg layers. And so I was determined I'm going to not buy eggs anymore. And so I had all my breeds picked out. I've been looking. I called. I was getting them from Murray McMurray Hatchery. And they were sold out to June. And I wanted to have chicks much earlier than that. And so... Um, I ended up, I'm going to take my mask off because I'm up here. I ended up ordering an egg layer special, and I had to get 25. And so I thought, I'll have them for this class. And if anybody wants to buy chicks, I'll have them ready for you. But because of the freezing weather and the snow, there was an embargo on shipping live animals. And so this morning, they were in St. Paul, Minnesota. So they're almost here. So um, at the end of the class, if any of y'all are interested, it's a variety of egg layers. So it's all different colors, and we're not going to know what breed they are. They could be fancies. They could be leggards. Um, let me know, okay? 
and so I'm sorry we don't have baby chicks here tonight. They were so close and they should have been here. But hopefully if some of you are interested, you got to see our chick chickens across the street. And if you'd like to stop by and see them on a day when it's not raining and see our setup, please feel free to. Okay. So again, stop me any time to ask questions. My hands are almost frozen here. Okay. Whoops. Okay, so reasons to have backyard chickens. Um, I always like to show, I had one really, really good garden in my lifetime, and I always show pictures of it. So if you've been to other programs, you've probably seen a picture of it. Um, but we had a chicken coop right where these plants are. And um, then we moved the chicken coop, and we had the best soil ever. And so, you know, for their compost, for their chicken manure, is one awesome reason for chickens because that chicken manure is great nitrogen source. You have to let it sit, you have to let it compost. And I'll tell another side note, we had some friends who put in a raised bed like the ones we have out here because they sell ours, and they got some chicken manure that was not composted, and it rested that galvanized metal. It ate all the way through that metal. So you have to compost your chicken manure six months, a year. Um, you can't put it on your garden, it will kill everything. Colored eggs, beautiful eggs, fresh eggs, and backyard chicken eggs have the best, yellowest, richest, healthiest yolk, and you can just tell a difference. So once you get used to using backyard chicken eggs, it's hard to go back to the light lemon yellows of the grocery store eggs. And they're much healthier. They're supposed to have higher omega-3s, lower cholesterol, and to not have to buy your eggs is a big deal. This Miss White, that <laughs> was Sai, she's my sixth grader's teacher now. Um, baby chicks are so much fun. It's always fun to get to raise baby chicks, watch the life cycle, and watch those um, hatch. So we've done that for a while. Um, this was one of our coop setups that we had. Now you can have any kind of coop setup. There are so many different ones. You know, everything from trampolines that have been converted to chicken coops. I mean, I've seen so many different kinds of beautiful ones that you could live in yourself. Um, we've, I think we're on about number seven, I think. And we've ended up with one we like, and I think it will probably be the one that sticks. Um, but this was a triangle one. Idea was chicken tractor. So we had sleds um, that moved under there, and then you can move it from place to place. One thing I've learned with chickens is if you have a chicken tractor and you're trying to keep your grass alive, you got to move it frequently. So about weekly if you want to keep your grass alive because those chickens are really good at looking for bugs, looking for worms, and they're going to dig in there. So um, just make sure you don't leave a chicken tractor in one place unless you want to kill the grass there and make a garden bed later, which is a great thing to do. Um, we've had a lot of luck with the electric netting, the poultry netting. It's what we use across the street. We have a solar battery that charges, and um, we got ours from Premier One, or you can even get them on Amazon. They're expensive for a first time, but once you have them, they will keep roaming neighbor dogs out. They will keep um, possums, you know, anything that tries to get chickens, because we know everything likes to eat chicken. Yes, sir. Ain't that because you had like these uh, strings of uh, water on top of it? Ain't that because of Yes, yes, you are very smart. Because we had, we used to have our chicken coop back here, and we had it set up. And everything else was being kept out by our electric fence. But a hawk swooped down, got my favorite chicken, took her off. And it was because the hawks weren't afraid of that wire. So we have put just strings that are not electrified across the top of our little fencing. And the idea is that hawks are afraid to, or it kind of confuses their eyesight, I think. And so they're less likely to land in there. So it's not much. It's just a few strings. But so far, it has been helpful for us. Now, chickens are smart. When they see a shadow, they'll run and hide. But, you know, hawks are very hungry. And also owls at night can be a predator too, so if they don't get up in time. But chickens are smart. They go in usually as soon as the um, sun starts to go down. But don't you have that big lot laying in the rooster? Don't they protect the hens? Yes, yeah, so a good reason to have a rooster is because they will help protect the hens. And that's why they get so mean, right? Because they're protecting them. 
Also, roosters are supposed to be good because they'll help find food for the hen is another good reason. And plus, um, just trying to protect them. Because it's fun when we put food in there for them, the rooster, he'll make these funny noises, which is like saying, hey, there's food. Come and look at the food. But yes, they can help protect them too. So, um, yes, everything wants to eat chickens. And that is usually, I think, Landon, you may disagree with me, but probably the hardest part of keeping backyard chickens is having a predator-proof cage. Um, another thing that's good to have, we have them across the street. When you drive out, you'll probably see a little red light blinking. We have these little solar things called predator eyes, and they're not very expensive. Um, and mo I don't know if Chambers has them or not, but you can definitely order them online. Tractor Supply might have them. But you put them at, let's say, coyotes are your main predator. You would put it at about predator eye height, and it's just a red blinking up light, and it's supposed to scare away the predators. So... You know, I'm not positive it works, but it's worth a try. So it's just a solar um, powered, and then um, you put it on there, and you can. They usually give you a pack of them, so you can put them at different heights to kind of, you know, you can think mink or possum down lower, then coyote, you know, have them at different um, lights. And I know um, Radonna Sims with Extension. Radonna was the one that told me about them, and she said since she had those predator eyes, she hadn't had any trouble with predators. So worth a try. <laughs> worth a try for sure. Um, with your coop, this is one that is the chicken tractor that's out in the field, and you can see that this one is pulled by a tractor, and so it would stay longer than on your fresh grass because you're not so worried about that. You're fertilizing it, you're killing bugs, you know, the chickens are eating the bugs, it's good nutrition for the chickens, and so um, it's very good to have on a small farm, or if you had a field, you know, it's a really good way to have chickens and they get fresh grass. This was inside that one. You can tell it's got wire all the way around it. This is chicken wire, but I'm not a big fan of chicken wire. Um, we had we had chicken wire out here one time, and right away raccoons, like day one, got in there, pulled off the chicken wire. Um, my dog can get through rusted chicken wire. So we use hardware cloth. I definitely use hardware cloth. You don't have to use the teeny tiny, but think about you want it small enough so that a raccoon or me could not stick their hand through there. Because um, raccoons, they can stick their hand through while a chicken's sleeping, and they will decapitate that thing. So um, be careful of those. So I definitely use chicken wire, or don't use chicken wire. I would use hardware cloth. Um, nest boxes, you're going to want nest boxes. Chickens like to share nest boxes, so you don't need one nest box per chicken, and Landon, you'll probably get more into this. This was a coop that I liked. This is the front of it. This is at um, Lee Haynes at um, his Fox Hollow Farm. Fox, I can't remember the name of the farm. But they had taken a little storage building and converted it into a chicken coop. And it was nice and sturdy, waterproof, but you'll see they've got nice hardware cloth all the way across the front of that. It's easy to get in if you have a chicken coop that you're going to clean out. You want to make sure you can get in there. Because um, it's hard if you have to be on your knees or bending down in there. Oh, this was my cousin's. And you can tell they've had hardware cloth. And they have had chickens. Or that one's got chicken wire. They've had, they've had trouble with their chickens um, getting killed by predators. But you want to have some kind of skirt, like a hardware cloth skirt around the edges. Or you want to bury that hardware cloth into the ground so nothing can dig under because think about dogs, you know, a dog can dig under in no time. So you want some kind of protection around the side. You can't just set it on the ground and be done. Um, about a one foot skirt, like just imagine stapling hardware cloth onto it and um, kind of laying it on the ground. It'll keep things from digging. So you want to make sure you have some kind of, um, almost like a moat, some kind of wire moat around the edge. This was um, another one in our yard that was a chicken tractor. It um, moved and had wheels, so that was an easy one. We didn't have to clean it out, so it was okay to be down low. And we had a little door. You can see the door in the front. And the door in the front, this has a pointer. The door in the front um, was what we opened to let them free range. Um, I like to let my chickens free range when we're home with them, or even sometimes when we're not home with them. And there needs to be some way that the coop can open up to let them free range. This was when we used to live in Ohio, and it was a lot easier to keep chickens in Alabama than it is in Ohio, because we would have to go in there and um, 
defreeze the door to get it open, get the snow and the ice out to get in there, and then bring in fresh water all the time, which we had to deal with a couple weeks ago. Um, so it's just a lot easier. But that coop made it through the snow, and chickens are amazingly hardy. Um, this is a setup for brooding with baby chicks. You're going to need um, a light, and I've got some more pictures of brooding a little bit later on. So chicken breeds. Let's talk about chicken breeds. Um, when we first started with chickens, I was really interested in the friendly ones because I had kids, and I wanted to have ones that were good egg layers, could um, free range, were dual purpose. So you'll hear a lot about either meat birds, egg birds, or dual purpose that could be used for meat and eggs. Um, so personality was important to me. Um, here's one that's a rooster. This is my cousin Luke, and it's one that he could still hold and handle. And so different breeds um, have different dispositions according to what you want. You may want chickens that you can process um, early and quick. You may want egg layers that are going to lay as many eggs as possible um, or are long-lived or good personalities. Or you might want colored eggs. Um, we got fertilized eggs from different places and tried to hatch them one year. And I must admit, I was I was careful. I switched them every day. You know, I moved them. I followed all the rules. They were in my kitchen. I watched them closely. But we only had two two chicks at hatch out. So I think we had some trouble with our fertilized eggs. I think they actually weren't um, very fertile. But since we have a friend that has an incubator, and he's super good at like at hatching them. So we just do that. But those two chicks that I hatched out myself. Um, they were, they were very special to us, and we took very good care of them. And one was a rooster, of course. Um, I live in town, so I have to be careful about roosters. But um, with baby chicks, so uh, a broody hen can be a good thing if you want baby chicks. Um, if you want your chicken to lay and not have babies, then a broody hen is not a good thing. So my Brahmas, my young Brahmas, have been the broodiest chickens I've ever had, ever, um, they'll both go broody at the same time. They've gone broody multiple times in their life. Um, so then that's not been a good thing because we don't have a rooster. <laughs> and so they're just not laying eggs and they're losing weight. And um, So broody hens are a good thing if you want to hatch your own babies, which is an easy way to do it because the mama knows what to do. And I don't know if I should tell a horror story about this or not, but I'll go ahead because y'all are wanting to know all the things about chickens, right? Um, we had a mama that was an Ostrilorp, which are ones that are usually good broody chicks, chickens. And she went broody, so we had fertile eggs at the Agriplex. So I thought, I'll get some, I'll bring them home and let her sit under it. She was the best sitter. She sat and sat. And so we were at like, you know, right before it was time for him to hatch out. And we were watching and everything was going good. Well, one of them fell out of the, well, it hatched. And then it fell out of the nest. And so I got it, I put it back in the nest. And um, that mother killed the baby. And I thought, well, that was just some strange thing. Well, she did it a second time, and it was just terrible. And that does not happen very often. That's very unusual. But after that, we knew that we were never going to do uh, baby chicks under her again. So that's unusual. I talked to a bunch of people that had chickens, and I heard of maybe like one that had ever experienced that. Have y'all ever had experience with that, Landon? Do you know the cure for that? Is it just bad luck? Yes. <laughs> we still have her, but we don't use her to be broody. Yes, ma'am. I don't know. I think she knew what the eggs were, and she wanted to sit on the eggs, like, because she really liked to sit on the eggs. But I think she was confused about the chick. And that doesn't go with Mother Nature. You know, I don't know why that happened. It was very sad. You know, it was very, very sad. One thing about chickens, you've heard about the pecking order. Well, it is true. You know, chickens can be some of the sweetest critters, but they can be some of the meanest creatures out there. And it's sad to me because it's always my favorite chicken, the one that's at the bottom of the pecking order. When you get new chickens to bring in, they become the meanest one, you know, because they're trying to beat up on the next one in line. So chickens can be very mean. Yes. Um, they're also learning how to break a booty hen. How to break a booty hen? What I've tried to do is just every day get them and take them and put them out, take them and put them out, or if you close off where they can get to, to lay, then that's supposed to help too, like if you close off their laying boxes. But if you have others laying, it's kind of hard. Landon? Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay. Yeah, close off their nest. Yes, so it, it's hard if you have multiple ones. You can keep chickens that don't do that Yes. if you just want eggs. 
Yes, and um, different breeds are different, you know, and that's one of the things, like in this um, Murray McMurray, if you read about the breed, they'll say these are good fruity hens or not fruity because that's a factor of that. Um, you said that you had some silkies. Silkies usually are good fruity hens, which if you want them to lay or to, you know, to raise babies, that's a good thing. But if you don't, then that's a bad thing. So something to consider. When you um, get baby chicks, this is a brooder setup. And um, it's really important about temperature. When you first get them, you want them to be like at 95 degrees, which is really warm. And the chicks themselves will let you know if they are warm enough. So you'll see my little picture. Um, so if your chicks are as far away from the light as they can be, then they are hot, right? And so that's not right. If they are um, over right here, if everybody is under the light, that means they're too cold. But if they're scattered out nicely, kind of randomly, then that means they're comfortable, your temperature is good. And if they're all on this side, this means there's a draft. There's a really cold spot in your cage. So um, you saw in my pictures earlier, we've had them in an aquarium. Our latest um, place to put them has been in a, um, one of those little tanks you can sink in the ground for a little fish tank. And um, you know what I'm talking about? Like for a goldfish pond, it's really, really heavy plastic and it's big. And they can't jump out of there. Because it doesn't take the chicks very long to be able to jump out of wherever you have them. And this one has a screen on top. And then um, you're going to want a good heat bulb, too. Yes, sir. Um, now, on in that plastic coat, the only issue I've had on green chicken is that if you have the heat and get too high, it'll melt the side plastic. Yes, and we have had that happen, too. We've had a Rubbermaid in the back here when we've had baby chicks, and we melted the Rubbermaid for that very reason. So you're going to want your light to either be hanging or you're going to want it to be on the screen. But you want to be very careful because heat lamps can be very dangerous with fire. So um, I have one that is plastic. It's plastic all the way around and has a little plastic um, kind of holder on there, a guard for the chickens. And so just be very, very careful of fire because it doesn't take much to start a fire with a heat lamp. Oh, I just had to show you this chart. So when we first started with chickens, we had three chickens. My husband was in graduate school and maybe he had too much time on his hands because he charted our chickens egg laying. <laughs> so you can see um, we had another Brahma at that time. I like the Brahmas. They're big and pretty with feathers on their feet. But um, she was the very worst layer. She was this was the really bad production. She ate a lot, but she did not lay a lot. Um, but from this adventure, we also had a speckled Sussex, Johnny, and she was really pretty. And then... Um, June was our Buff Orpington, and June became my favorite chicken because I love Buff Orpington. I had to put a picture of the rat in here because um, when we lived in Illinois, Chicago was trying to pass the backyard chicken effort, uh, ordinance, but it did not pass. It failed because, and the reason was because of rats, because they thought that chickens would attract rats. And at first I was like, oh, that's not true. You know, we don't have any rats. We don't have problems with mice. Chickens will eat mice. They're good micers. Um, mousers. Um, but then, sure enough, eventually, we got some rats. And so you have to be really careful with your chickens. They make feeders that are like no waste feeders so they don't drop food. Um, you need to make sure wherever your chicken feed is that it's up in a metal container that the rats can't get in because, sure enough, if you have grain, you can attract rodents. So it's just something to know. You want to be careful with that so you don't attract rodents because they will follow the chickens. Okay, so Breeze will go and check. How are we doing on time? Okay, um, I'm just gonna quickly go over some of the breeds with you because it's kind of the fun part when you're trying to decide what kind of chickens to get is what kind of breeds to get. The Buff Orpington was the one that I told you about is my favorite. They are um, usually very friendly. Um, now there are Lavender Orpingtons and there's also a White Orpington. But this buff, kind of little red hen, is the typical Orpington. They lay good eggs. Um, they are very long-lived, and they're not too big. They're not too little. Um, they're just really easy-going chickens, and again, one of my very favorites. Are they the fruity kind? They, I think they're kind of in the middle. Um, do you have experience with them? Yeah, they're not all that. They're a dual purpose, uh, but they're not. 
I've never had a Buffalo Bentingo broody. Oh, I, I take that back. We had one across the street that hatched eggs for us, but we wanted her to, so it was a good thing. Um, she hatched babies for us a few years ago and did a really good job. Now, I'll tell you another horror story. I guess after you've done it a long time, you get these horror stories. We had another Buff Orpington mama that was sitting on a nest across the street, and it was hot, but my experience had always been the chickens get off their nest to go get water and get food, and I did not give her any extra water. Well, she died, and I think that she dehydrated. I think she was, you know, so maternal on being broody and sitting on those eggs, she did not get off. So after that, I kind of learned my lesson to always offer them fresh water where they can reach it while they're on their nest or make an effort of going daily and shooing them off those nests because their brains as hormones just do crazy things to them. Um, when they are broody, when a chicken gets broody, and Lynn is going to talk about this a little bit more, their feathers, they hold their feathers funny. They start making funny noises. Like, it just changes them completely. To sit on the eggs, to line the nest. I think you're right, yeah, to make a, a soft place for them. Um, the rocks, we're talking about Plymouth rocks, they can come in several different colors and these were, um, so these are all, right now these we're talking about our dual purpose and then they're also heirloom breeds, so they've been around a long time. These came with the settlers with Plymouth rock, like it says, with the uh, pilgrims. I'm sorry, can you tell, what, tell us what color the eggs they lay? Oh yes, I can. And a curious fact on chickens, do y'all know how to tell what color the chicken lays? Ear what mode. about the chickens? Yes. So their earlobes tell you what color they, they lay. And some chickens you can see their earlobes easily, and some you can't. Um, some of the ones we have a picture of, you can see they have bright white earlobes, and so that means they lay, lay white eggs. So um, the Buff Orpington is a brown egg, just kind of standard pretty brown egg, a good size egg. Plymouth Rocks are the same. Their eggs are similar. And Plymouth rocks can come in, this is the barred rock. They can also come in a white rock. There's a partridge rock that's really pretty. There's several different uh, rocks, and they are big, um, pretty birds, healthy birds. And one of the things you'll hear about is foraging. Um, some of the hybrid birds are not as good foragers. So if you let them out, they're not going to go and eat as many bugs and plants and supplement their own feeding. Um, but these heirloom breeds, they do a really good job with that. Um, the Australorp, these are a part Orpington, and um, they're a black, real shiny bird. They're really pretty. Um, I've had some good ones, and I've had some crazy ones, but I think that's just the luck of the draw. Has anybody had good luck with Australorps? Okay. A lot of people really like them. We've just had some crazy ones along the way. Silkies. Now, the silkies, are. we had somebody gave us two silkies one time, and they had been um, in the house. They were house chickens. <laughs> and um, so when we got them, we, we um, were trying to integrate them, but usually silkies are smaller birds, and our big chickens, you know, were terrible to them. So we had to take them out. We could not keep them with our big chickens. Uh, I found something that helps. If you guys want some baby chicks, keep like a standard size chicken in there. Uh -huh. And that's something that you can really be in the ocean a lot. And it'll help them integrate if they're already together. Okay, good news, because putting babies with big ones is a whole um, ordeal. It is hard. If you have chickens, you know, if you think, well, I'll start with three of them, maybe down the road I'll get three more, I would go ahead and start with six. Go ahead and get your six babies together, because if they start together, it's a lot easier than um, if you try to integrate them later. It can be done, but it's work. you got to work it. But silkies, are, they um, are all different colors. They're pretty. They're, they're beautiful birds, but they're small birds. Um, Easter eggers, so our eggs that we're giving away today are Easter eggers. Um, there's an Americana, an Ericana, but now a lot of the, um, the ones that we might call Americanas are really Easter eggers, which just means they lay a green or a light blue pastel egg. Martha Stewart eggs is what we used to call them. And they're good layers. They're really, really good layers. So ours um, has been the most prolific layers of all of ours. They're a good size egg, but they're the colorful ones. And you'll know them by they have little, um, can you see their little poopy cheeks? Mm -hmm. They have feathers on their cheeks. So that's one way that you can tell they're Easter eggers. And they come in all different colors. There's white ones, there's dark ones, there's speckled ones, but they're usually really pretty. So um, they're really beautiful birds. I would definitely recommend them. They're friendly. They're they're good birds. Yes, sir. Uh, 
But then once I have, I got some really good breeders, so I know that they're actually true Americanas. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so if you want actual Americanas, you just want to make sure when you order them, you know, that you know they're Americanas, or they're from a breeder who's breeding an Americana breeding pair. Like in the uh, catalog, they have like East Trigger, but they also have like a blue Americana, but they label them as Americanas. As Americanas, yes. So if you're, a lot of times, Easter eggers can be called Americanas, but Americanas aren't usually called Easter eggers. It's kind of like a pure raising, right? So the Americanas are more of your pure breed, your Easter eggers are more your hybrids. Sometimes they're a little bit of mutts. <laughs> okay, Rhode Island Red, and this one, she's kind of like the little red hen to you. Um, you have a Rhode Island Red? Do you like her? She's a good chicken. She's one of the main ones. <laughs> That are different. Um, they're usually good hens. They're a good size. They lay brown eggs. Um, they're smart. They're a dual purpose breed, and they're good egg layers as well. Good conversion of food to um, to eggs. So, and they're friendly, friendly chickens too. Um, this one's a silver lace lion dot. We're getting a little bit fancier here. They're really, really pretty. Um, they're a little bit smaller, and we had trouble with integrating our lion dot into our bigger chickens. We had bad luck with them. So um, just think about it. If you're getting different sizes, big chickens and little chickens, sometimes those little chickens just can't make it in there. So um, it can be hard for them. The Brahmas, they're the ones I was telling you about. They're beautiful birds, um, calm and gentle and beautiful. They have feathered feet. Um, this is a, I have to think about, this is a light Brahma. The light Brahmas are white. And then I have, um, the brown Brahmas, I think, the or buff Brahmas. What are they called? Dark Brahmas. dark Brahmas, yes. There's a buff Brahma too, right? I have the dark Brahmas, and they came from Chambers Seed and Feed here. Chambers had some really neat breeds of chickens. Um, and they're beautiful, like I said, but they um, are have not been good egg layers and have been terribly broody. Um, is y'all the Brahma? Is the rooster a Brahma that we take out? Okay. They took one of our roosters, because of course we got six chicks and two were hens and four were roosters. Um, which happens if you don't get already sex chickens. And still, if you get sex chickens, you're 90% chance of, of having um, that be correct. But they're beautiful. They lay big brown eggs. Um, the Americana, we talked about that. So they do lay the beautiful Easter eggs. And this one is a true Americana, not an Easter egg. Um, this one was a speckled Sussex. Somehow I didn't get the name on there. But they're an old breed. They are a heritage breed. They're not as heavy bodied as some of the other ones, but um, she, the one we had, she was very smart. She laid great eggs and they're brown eggs. Um, the Maran, has anybody ever had any Marans? They lay a dark colored egg that looks like chocolate. So a chocolate, so there's like a cuckoo Maran and um, there's several and they're beautiful, but for the egg color is the main reason a lot of people have them. So have you had good luck with them? Just started laying like this January, so the, the rooster looks like, you know, he doesn't have all that brilliant color. Right, not quite as pretty. Yeah, but the eggs are that, I mean, they're... They look like chocolate, right? Yeah, if you're doing a mixture of eggs, it's definitely great to have in there. They're a, um, an old breed as well, dual purpose, good, you know, foragers, all that stuff. They're good chickens. Um, now, this is a hybrid chicken, and I used to be a very big fan of heirloom chickens, but we got some Golden Comets, and actually, they're some of my favorites now. Um, a great thing, and Golden Comets and Red Stars are very similar, and there's some other hybrid ones, and these are called sex-linked chickens, because the males are one color, and the females are one color. So you're 100% right that you're getting either a hen if you want a hen, or a rooster if you want a rooster. Um, they are... Um, easy to get. Tractor Supply usually has them, but ours um, are good layers, and ours have been the very friendliest chickens we have. We have one whose name is Minerva, and she follows you everywhere around the yard. You know, she's just right there. She's your friend. She wants to be carried. Of all of our chickens, she is the friendliest, and um, they, it says that they're prone to health problems. Well, our Minerva, we had two, Minerva and Fox. They were Harry Potter characters, and um, Minerva had this big kind of growth on her chest when we when she was little, and we thought, oh, she's not going to make it, you know. But she is now years and years old. She's one of our grandma chickens, and she's doing great. So um, we've had really good luck with these. 
they're friendly. Um, they're not as big and fat, you know, as the little red hens, but they lay lots of eggs, and I, I really like them. So I've had very good luck with them. I heard from somebody down there at a chicken auction that the red stars have actually been, uh, some of them, off, like, at, like some people have actually been uh, modified and keep on moving them as a line and make them pure. I've heard that from this is that chicken. Oh, interesting. And if you look at um, like the catalogs at the Murray McMurray, they have a whole bunch of different sex-linked chickens that are supposed to be, you know, they've got some green layers now, they've got some blue layers, all different ones that um, are sex-linked chickens. They're not the heirlooms, but they grow different colors of eggs. Yes, ma'am. What is the name? Isa, Isa Browns. Okay, sorry, Isa Browns, and they look. Thin. Have y'all had good luck with them? Yeah. And did they? Huge, huge. Huge. And they, well, when they were chickens, when they were tiny chicks, I accidentally had stepped on one of on one of its legs, and it's still so fine. And it's fine. It's fine. And, it's fine. and we had like three or four of them. Okay, where did y'all get them? Tractor supply. At Tractor Supply. This was last year, so I'm not sure this year. Right. Well, good. That's good. You know, it's always good to hear what chickens people have had luck with because, you know, I think that makes a big difference. They're good. They're very, very good. Very, very And we were talking about the Domineckers. Domineckers is what we always call them. Dominique, if, you know, if you're not from the South. Um, they are good old chickens. My granddad at Pinehart Farm used to always talk about his Dominecker chickens from when he was a boy. So they've been around a long time. But you'll notice they look like those barred rocks we showed you earlier, but look at their comb. So these have like a roseate comb, and it's one way to tell the difference. But they're dual purpose, lay brown eggs, good foragers, all the same of those, gentle birds. Um, this is one we got one time, and it was really pretty, a silver spangled hamburg, but it was the same thing. She was small, she was more pro size, and did not integrate well with those chickens, and we had to... I think she actually might have been, she might have met a bad fate from the other chickens. I think she did not make it. Yes. Um, I heard on them, um, Spit Talk, so whenever I was a bit younger, I thought that the Silver Spangled Hens bird, the Spit Talk, and I think that's how you pronounce uh -huh. them. I thought that it was the same thing, but I figured out this year that they're not. Oh, that they're different. And these, I was trying to remember where we got them. I think we had to order them, you know, specialty chicks, because they're not ones necessarily you'd have right around here. But they're beautiful birds. They're really, really pretty. Um, the Menorcas, do you see their white earlobe? Do you see the white earlobe? They lay a white egg um, because their earlobes are white. But they're a black ch chicken that look a lot like the Australorks, but they lay white eggs. So we had some of these before. We had luck with them. There were the Menorcas. Um, Leggerns. When um, we first got chickens, I told you I want a really friendly chicken. I thought leggerns, I read about them, that they were flighty, they weren't going to be the best chickens, but since this year I am ordering leggerns because they're supposed to be your best egg layer. They have the record for laying over 365 eggs in one year. Um, our rooster across the way, he's a leggern, we call him foghorn leghorn, and he's a big white chicken like you think of. Um, but they actually come in all different colors. You don't have to just get a white one. They're different colors. Um, they're supposed to be the very best egg layers. And people who've had them have had good luck with them being friendly and gentle. So, um, has anybody had leggerns? I've had the rock leggerns. And I like, which way should lay us a double yoker? Oh, double yoker once a week. Very nice. <laughs> so, if you haven't had um, chickens before, when you get that double yoker, it's really exciting. And you know, because that's a very big egg. Um, but I would definitely, I would recommend leggerns. That's kind of going full circle with that. Um, We've touched on a lot of the breeds. Does anybody have any other uh, suggestions of favorite breeds that you like? We have black Asians. Black Asians. Are they the fully black chickens? They got black bodies like an offshore, but their uh, heads and necks are kind of orange. Ah, okay. And some have more orange and some don't. But they're like a true black, you know, like the offshore has got a blue tint. Yes. The black Asians are real. Brown. And what color are their eggs? Brown. Brown. Okay, so black Asian. And they're about, you know, I would say like a jumbo egg. So y'all get some big eggs. We get some huge eggs. We actually got one one time that was the size of a hole in my hand. Oh my goodness, that's a really big egg. Um, we got, got some Rhode Island reds too that are they're all hard to pretty friendly. They set to each other. They're not pretty 
<laughs> Where did you I get the once. black the Asians? Uh, last year, Tractor Supply. Tractor Supply. Tractor Supply sounds like a good place to source. Yes, sir. Um, I really like the orange, uh, Duckling, Raymond, I have them here when I was a bit younger, and I also really like the uh, wooden colts. Like mixes, these mixes, they always just turn out different. Oh, right, right, right. So you're hybrid chickens, right? Like we have mutts and dogs. Why don't we have mutts and chickens? You definitely can, right? If you have a rooster, that's what we had over here. You know, we had our Lego rooster with our buff Orpington. So it was a Orpington Lego and Cross, and they were very, very pretty chickens. Tell me about your bantam. Um, so a bantam is just like a miniature chicken. You can have a buff Orpington bantam. There's so many different breeds of bantams out there, and they're beautiful. So did you keep yours with your big chickens, or did you keep them separate? Uh, where we first got bantams, I only had strictly bantams. And I had Banty is what, you know, we hear them called instead of bantam and banty. Uh, but they're little, but they can lay a lot of eggs. They're smaller eggs. How big are your eggs? Um, I've never had the little Kind of like a pullet size egg. Mm -hmm. So a pullet size is when your chicken first lays an egg. It's yeah. not as big. So they are fun, but again, usually your banties don't do well with your big chickens. So if you want to have banties, you need to have banties. If you want to have big chickens, have big chickens, and not integrate. Do you mix like every spring or every summer? Do you mix new chickens? That's a good your question. Old chicken. How do, how do and that, that lady, I'll I'll say that you know I'm a vegetarian. I don't eat chickens. I eat eggs. And so um, our chickens get to be grandmother chickens. So Lynn is going to probably tell you a better flock management than we do because chickens can live to be 10 to 12 years old. And so if you're not planning on processing those chickens, that's a long time. And chickens slow down their egg laying to quit egg laying. So um, there's well, definitely a science. To answer your question, birds are going to, as they age, they're going to have different nutritional requirements than some of your younger bullets. So might want to, the main reason to keep them separated is nutrition. Um, so that's, you know, and then taking more, some of those older girls can be, they can be kind of mean. So, uh, but nutrition would be your main reason for separation. I'm going to tell you, okay. and, um, we will tell you the back door is open right here if anybody needs the bathroom break. Right? We're not for a while, but And we have a question over here. Okay. Do we have a question over here? A witch's egg? Yeah. I don't know. No idea. Fairy egg? Fairy egg? Oh, okay. Yeah, but it means they don't have a, a yolk. Oh. No yolk. So why? I mean, is it... So it's just, it just happens sometimes. Yeah, it just... It, it's, it's pretty rare, um, but um, it does happen from time to time. It's, it's usually... It just didn't develop properly. She's showing a picture of her double yellow. The larger size chickens, can you mix breeds if they're all pretty much the same size? Yeah, so the question is if you have, uh, can you mix breeds, you know, if they're, if they're different sizes or you need to kind of stay with the same sizes? Um, honestly, it's, it's more about if they were raised together. Um, bringing them up together is a lot easier uh, than introducing a new one. Um, because um, they can be pretty brutal. Um, and, and if they're bigger, say for instance the Brahmas, those birds can be 20 pounds um, as, as full grown birds. Um, and then you're bringing in a young bullet, you know, that may be five pounds. Um, she's going to struggle, you know, to, to get to the feed, to get to the water. Um, and so she's just not going to do well socially um, mixing her like that. If we have, like, a Cuckoo 
level. So we took him back and we were putting him in the way to the man. Rick tried again a couple weeks ago. He was just That yeah. means he's never going to get any better. Most likely. Like, okay. Yeah. So chickens can be carnivorous. And that's, um, you know, in roosters especially, they can be too aggressive. What if you pull a rooster out of the mix or just the hen? Is there a difference? Um, so hens, you can have a dominant hen that can do very similar to what the rooster does. Um, typically, your your roosters um, are going to be more aggressive, um, especially as, if they're becoming sexually mature, um, especially with those hens. Um, he's kind of trying to establish his dominance. Um, and so um, sometimes you just have to get another rooster. Um, if he just, I know, if he just can't be acclimated and, and with that group, um, you just have to pull him out because he'll keep killing his hens. Um, he may get to the point that, you know, if you've got 10, he may get down to 6, but Probably you got to be, you know, yeah. yeah. So sometimes we're just better in suit. That's what he did. I'm not going to do that. Can you buy bigger chickens? I don't like the sound of all them babies. So, yeah, um, so sometimes, you know, for instance, she's got a rooster for sale. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, um, you can. It's just like with any other livestock. Sometimes people sell their non-producers. Oh, okay. um, you know, you don't you don't always get the best ones when you're buying from someone's flock. Um, you know, but you may have somebody that's going out of business. Um, we here locally in in every county now, but we have a little program called 4-H Chick Chain, um, and so you can go to the to the 4-H Chicken Auction and you can purchase 20 week old bullets there. Um, and so that's one option for you if you don't want to brew. Yeah. Um, so you let the kids do all the work. You kind of pay them for their birds. Um, so you kind of do two where things. Is, where is that? Um, so here in Coleman, um, I think, do they do it at the fairgrounds? Um, well, I'm here at first. I don't know where they've done it. Okay. So but you can call your local extension office and they can tell you in which county. Um, so, but um, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started because... Uh, it's fairly cold. <laughs> yeah. um, so, uh, like she said, my name is Landon Marks. Uh, I'm an animal science agent uh, here in North Alabama. I'm over in Northeast Alabama. Um, and so I was originally from Coleman, so I graduated from West Point. Um, so this is kind of like coming home for me. Um, but uh, I really appreciate the partnership that we have here with Rachel and with Agriplex because uh, this gives us a really great opportunity to speak to you guys. So we're here for you. If you have any questions beyond tonight, uh, we can certainly answer those. Um, so, uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my experiences. I will say, um, I am an animal breeder and a uh, repro person by trade, and it's, uh, my, uh, my specialty is cattle. Um, so, why is the cattle guy up here talking to me about chickens, right? Um, so, when I started um, in my job, we had just started what's called 4-H Chick Chain, and it exploded. Uh, in Alabama. I mean exploded. Um, so, um, you know, just within a few years of me working, I had to become a poultry guy really fast. Um, and so, um, I had had chickens. I grew up on a commercial chicken farm. Um, so, I understood, you know, a lot of bird biology. Um, and But it's a little different concept when you think about backyard poultry. So, um, we talked a lot about breeds. Um, I put some of, some of my experiences up here. Um, she, she talked about leggerns. Um, if you get um, some leggerns that come from, say, some of the commercial hatcheries, um, they are wild as buck deer. Um, they just are. Um, so a lot of birds, it's all in how you kind of raise them to. Um, so if they're, uh, they're used to being around you, they're used to being around people, um, you're going to have a lot better uh, experience with them than if they were brooded maybe by mama. Okay? Uh, if your mama, in a way, if you if you did the brooding from a chick, um, but if mama brooded them and she's out there and they run from you every time you go into the barn, um, they're a little bit different as far as how they respond um, rather than if they're they're used to seeing you and you're bringing them food and water every day. Um, so, um, but leggerns can certainly be um, wild if, if you didn't brood them. So, um, Americanas, to me, uh, with my experience with Americanas, um, I say they look like little hawks because of their beak, um, but they are a little bit, um, they're a little less docile than some of the others to me. They take longer um, to go into production. So they're going to be closer to 24 to 30 weeks before they start laying eggs, where some of your birds can be laying eggs at 16 to 18 weeks. Uh, so your Americanos take a little bit longer 
uh, most of the time before they go into production. Um, so um, my favorite is the Buff Orpington. Um, if you're going to have um, a really gentle, really easy uh, bird to work with, um, Buff Orpingtons are your bird. Um, so they, they just work really well. They're a dual purpose. They're not going to lay 365 days. They're going to lay more like 200. Um, but they, they are a really nice breed to kind of start with. Um, Australorps are really good. They're dual purpose. Um, I will say that the, um, your reds, they're going to be, they're going to be the queen of the coop. Um, so, um, those, those typically are, are kind of the top of the pecking order for the most part. Um, Brahma's beautiful. They're kind of like that big 1800 pound cow that eats all day and has the smallest calf. <laughs> all right. So they are very inefficient. Uh, so they are big birds. Uh, I personally am not crazy about uh, feather legs because they get they get kind of nasty. Um, so if you don't do a really good job of keeping your coop clean, you got to think about that when you're handling them. So you got to do a lot of cleaning on all those feathers. Um, so um, there's lots of breeds, and we brought some uh, uh, some catalogs that you can kind of look at. Uh, don't get those naked necks. They're so ugly. Uh, they are so ugly. Nobody looks to look at a chicken that's missing feathers. All right, so, uh, but naked necks are, are good. We actually had them in our chick chain project this past year. Um, and so, uh, but it's just really interesting to see. Uh, it kind of looks like, you know, a turkey neck under there. Um, so, uh, but these are just some of the ones um, uh, that I've put. We've had all of these uh, for the most part other than the game. Um, in our chick chain project, so um, I've had a lot of experience with, with most of these. All of these the kids can handle. Um, so um, when we're thinking about um, birds, the Brahma gets a little tougher um, on some of you know the kids to hold um, because they can get up 15, you know, 18 pounds. Uh, those Orpingtons, Australs, they're going to be about a 10 pound bird, um, so they're a little bit easier to handle. Okay. Yes. On that chick chain project, uh -huh. when are y'all going to be doing this part on the game? We're not probably going to do game. And the reason why is because they're judged based off of their standard of perfection. So they have to be a purebred. So um, the only one we let slip in there is the Americana. Because uh, she said, you know, Americana is kind of one of the mutts. Um, they don't have a standard of perfection associated with APA. Um, but we let them slide in because they're pretty. Um, but um, so we probably won't use the game. Um, so, yes. Oh, I didn't know I was being camera. My goodness, I would have fixed my hair. Uh, so, uh, the, um, so a couple of the different ones, we talked a little bit about egg laying, dual purpose, and meat breeds. Um, certainly, um, Cornish is one that we think about when we think about meat. Um, if you're going to get into kind of that fryer uh, type business where you're going to raise um, some rollers um, and be able to package those um, for folks, um, the Cornish is certainly one to, to look at. Uh, the New Hampshire Reds work really well. Um, they're going to grow really fast. Um, and the Javas, those are great. Jersey Giants, those are big, beautiful birds. Um, if you're looking for that you know, basic dual purpose, the ones that she's talked about um, are really good. One thing on the wine dots, they are beautiful, uh, but they're slow layers. Um, so they're not going to lay quite as productive um, as some of your other dual purpose. Um, and then as far as your egg laying, you know, she talked about the Leggerns, the uh, Araconas, Polish, Sex links, um, all those are going to be really good uh, for egg laying. Okay, a couple of slides on brooding. Um, like she said, uh, the one thing that people do wrong usually because they see it at, at tractor supply and some of the farm stores, they get these big, tall water uh, troughs like what you uh, do with livestock, and those are just a little too deep. Um, so um, you got to think about um, what those chicks have in the bottom um, because. What happens is the airflow is just getting kind of rough down there because it's so deep. Um, so, um, you know, about three feet, uh, two to three feet of it is plenty deep um, when you're thinking about your brooder. Um, I've used a wash tub before. You know, those work pretty well. You can get cardboard, um, like if you're going to do it in a garage, um, then you can put some newspaper down and use a cardboard ring um, to be able to do this. Um, one thing I do is I use some saw horses, put a broomstick across them, and wrap the the cord around that broomstick uh, for my lamp, and then you can roll it um, in order to adjust that light. That's how you're going to adjust your temperature. Now, she talked about temperature at 95 degrees. That's 95 degrees down there where the birds are. 
So what you want to do is get you a thermometer and you place it down in the broom. So you can get one of those hand thermometers um, or you can cheat like me and get one of those indoor outdoors and put the, the, uh, the reader down there with them so I can look at it beside my bed on the nightstand. Um, but you need a way to check temperature um, on those birds throughout the night and you're going to roll that uh, lamp. So you're going to start, uh, when you get them, they're going to be three days old. Okay, so um, if you if you ordered them through the mail, so they're going to come and they're going to be about three days old, um, and so you're going to start at 95, and every week you're going to adjust that temperature by five degrees. Um, so about three weeks, you're going to go from 95 to 90 to 85, um, and so you're going to adjust down about five degrees as they go. And in about three to four weeks, they're going to start jumping and feathering, and they're going to be all over the place. Um, so then you know you're going to have to do something different. Um, so um, don't overthink this process. Um, make sure when you're uh, when you put feed in front of them for the first time, open up that feeder. So most of them, you're gonna get these feeders that's got the guard that's on top. Take that guard off. You want to make sure that they they can get to the feed. And then in the next couple of days, put that guard back on. Um, but you want to make sure that they're eating really well. Um, on the waterer, change that water every day. Um, change that water every day. Um, so. You may even have to take your little beaks and dip it in the water just to make sure that you know that they're getting water because dehydration can be really um, a big issue when it comes to chicks because they can get dehydrated really fast. Um, so uh, this is this part um, can be sad sometimes. Not all chicks make through the brooding process. Um, so you may have some casualties. That's okay. Um, you know, it, it may be something that they had, you know, before they got to you. Um, they may get um, you know some type of issue that they just can't overcome, and that's okay. All right. Let me get through this, buddy, and then I'll answer your questions. Okay. Um, I really appreciate the young people here tonight. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited that y'all are here. Um, and um, and before y'all leave, we'll talk about maybe some opportunities that we have in 4-H too. So um, so housing and facilities. So when we move them from the brooding out to the facilities. This and nutrition are the two things that I get the most questions about when it comes to backyard chickens. Um, so there are tons of different facilities, and I love seeing the different ones because I like seeing the imagination um, of people when they when they do this. So um, about three to five weeks, we're going to be able to move them into this area. For us here in Alabama, you know, it gets pretty hot pretty quick from spring to summer. So you know, depending on when you're doing your brooding kind of is what matters as far as when you move them to a coop area. So it may be a hybrid. So you may have to kind of move your brooding facility into a coop. Um, so you may move your, um, your little brooder into the inside of a coop um, so that they can get under the heat when they need to, but then they can get away from it when they want to get away from it. Um, so that's going to be important that they are able to escape from that heat when they need to. Because when they're young, they're not feathered, right? They have down. So they have those little hair-like balls. But once they get feathered, then they have insulation. So they're, they can kind of uh, regulate their temperature better once they're feathered. And that happens at about three to four weeks of age. Um, so once they kind of get fully feathered and they're flapping around, they're going to do a better job um, of, of being able to keep their temperature where it needs to be. Now, I've, I've highlighted three, three things here that's going to be important for the success of your operation. Clean dry and protected, okay? Um, when I go see kids' uh, coops, um, if they're not clean and dry, they will not be successful in their project. Lots of things grow in moist fecal areas, okay? Um, so birds can get lots of things um, if they're not in a clean area. Uh, so they can pick up protozoa, they can pick up parasites, um, and it can be really devastating to these birds' health. Um, so making sure that you keep them clean, um, you keep them dry, uh, this time of year especially, um, we certainly would need to be able to have them in a dry space. Um, and then protected, you know, I think she did a really nice job talking about predator protection, um, but like she said, everything eats a chicken. Neighbor dogs are the worst culprit, okay? Um, understanding what type of protection you need is, is the biggest thing. Um, so yes. How much room does 10 chickens need? So um, chickens don't need a tremendous amount of space. 
Um, so, um, you know, you could you could get by with a 10 by 10, um, a, you know, an 8 by 10, as long as, you know, because there's a difference in the coop and the run. Um, so if you're going to do a coop and a run, or maybe you're going to coop them and let them free range, um, then they don't have to have a ton of space if you're just going to use that for maybe roosting at night um, or for them to come in and out of, uh, maybe having your nesting boxes in there. Uh, because everybody's not going to be in there at the same time. But it's it's going to be really funny when you see them roost for the first time because they're all going to pile up in a group on the ground. <laughs> um, and so you're going to think, man, I, why did I build this big facility if they're going to all get right here? Um, and then when they start roosting, you know, they're all going to be on a, on a pole um, or on a ladder or something that you create. So you don't need just a tremendous amount of space, um, but, you know, probably a 10 by 10 would be plenty uh, for that many. Um, so that's that was my next was space. Um, so um, you know when you think about the number, some people get real aggressive. You know they go and they get twenty chickens. Um, well, they're going to lay about an egg a day. I don't eat twenty eggs a day. Uh, so kind of think about how you know how many eggs that you would uh, you would need, or maybe if you're going to be an entrepreneur like some of these young people, and they're going to go up down the road and sell their eggs. Um, then you, you need to think about, you know, the number of eggs that you need. Six birds can feed a whole family just fine. Um, so you don't need just a tremendous amount um, in order to, to take care of you. Um, shade. Uh, they do need some shade in the summertime. Um, so um, you'll see them. They'll, they'll get over into the wooded areas if they free range. But if they're in a coop, you need to be able to protect them from the sun. Um, you know, and, and the sun moves all day. Um, so, you know, make sure that they can get out of the sun at all times of the day. Ventilation. We don't think about ventilation all that much, but if um, if you've got a coop and they're only going to be in the coop and they don't have a run associated with it, then you've got to have ventilation along the bottom, and you got to have twice that much ventilation at the top. Because when the air comes in and goes across the floor and it grabs those water molecules, what does it do? It expands, Right. And so as it expands, it goes up and it has to go out of that coop. Um, so if there's no way for it to go out, then what does it do? It becomes dew point, goes right back down, right? Um, so it's important to have some good ventilation in the summer because um, you'll see them over there and they'll just be kind of panting if there's not good ventilation. Um, so this is a good way to be able to keep your coop nice and dry. Uh, there's no advantage to putting shavings outside. Uh, because what happens to shavings if you set them outside? They're going to get wet and then they're going to dry. Yeah, they're going to absorb, right? Um, so shavings are nice on the inside because they absorb the moisture, they absorb some of the, the fecal material, and then you change them out. And I bet you're a good scooper. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so keeping, keeping those uh, cleaned out is a really important thing. Um, so... Um, that, that's going to become important. So when you look at these different uh, types of coops, these are all from 4-H kids. Um, and so I love looking at these because I like to see what they created in their mind. Um, and then some of them, like the top right, it's what Granddad created. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, it, it can be a whole family project. And that's what I love about backyard poultry is everybody can get involved in them. Uh, because they're really neat. Um, neighbors can even uh, come and watch them. Uh, chickens are fun to watch. You know, you just kind of watch them in the yard. They kind of uh, bring back some memories of, of childhood. So, um, But you can have something really nice that uh, you have the coop. They can go underneath um, the coop. They can go out into a coop yard. This is tall enough that you can go in with them. Um, I'm a big guy, all right? I have a hard time getting a chicken tractor, <laughs> all right? So um, I, I don't have a chicken tractor because um, I can't go in and enjoy them very much in that way. And so I want it to be a little taller so that I can go in. Um, chickens don't need a tremendous amount of head space, so if you do just want them to be able to run, you can make little tunnels, you know, that they go out into the yard so that they can do, you know, some of their grazing or foraging. Um, so they don't, you don't have to have a huge, nice facility for them to be able to, to move around in space. Um, you, can, you can have some that they move around. This was an old cotton wagon that they converted. Um, so if you've got a, something that you want to move, uh, that's certainly something to think about. Um, city ordinances, like she talked about, roosters are not allowed everywhere. So make sure um, that you, uh, if you live in a in a city, that you check with your municipalities. Some of them don't even let uh, birds at all. Um, so if you're if you plan on investing, then you need to make sure um, that you have 
uh, if you looked into that. So um, on facilities, there's a couple of things. Make sure um, that it protects the birds. It's easily cleaned because it's a chore if it's not. Um, and, um, and so if you want to enjoy it, make sure that it's easy for you to work. Uh, because otherwise, you're just going to get kind of burnt out on it, and it's not going to be fun anymore. Um, so also make sure you position it well on your property. The lowest point on the property where all the water drains to, not the best place for your chicken coop. All right? uh, it needs to be where water drains away uh, from that coop. Um, so also, if you're going to have an opening on it, um, open it to the south and the east. Um, that way, when the sun... Um, comes up, it'll actually dry that coop out. Uh, so some sunlight coming in the morning is really good because what kills pathogens better than anything? Sun. The sun. Yeah, so UV light. UV light kills lots of things. Um, so if you do purchase um, used feeders and waterers, bleach those. Um, you, can, you can bleach them with just a cap full of bleach to a gallon of water. Uh, bleach all of your stuff. That way um, it takes care of anything that might be coming from another um, group. And we talked about introducing birds before. Um, what's another reason why we don't put them straight in with our birds? Because they're younger bullets, they'll pick the crap out of them. Alright, so pecking the crap out of them. What's another reason? Sickness. Sickness. Biosecurity. Alright, so um, we, want to, we want to make sure that, um, that we uh, have a quarantine time. All right, so 15 to 20 days at least before you introduce them when you bought them from somewhere else. Um, so that chicken auction that you like to go to, um, that's probably a great place for sickness. It's kind of like taking your kids to kindergarten for the first time. You know how they come back with the sniffles? Uh, so birds can come back with the sniffles too. Um, so making sure that um, you quarantine them is, is going to be important. You got a question? No, my dad said... If you get new things in that chicken option, only get hatching eggs. I don't want you to bring any like respiratory, respiratory disease in. I bet you're a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right, and you're listening pretty well, so um, so they should be proud. Uh, yeah, so you want to make sure when you get them from somewhere um, that you're not as familiar with their herd health plan um, or their flock management, um, that you uh, quarantine those birds and make sure they're not sick. Okay? Um, so, um, and I don't know if you're going to share these slides with them. Um, yeah, so because some of this could be kind of small to see. Uh, but there are different uh, nutritional requirements based on their stage of production. Just like us, you, I bet you're eating a growing diet. So you can get big and strong, right? I need to be on a maintenance diet. Because right? I'm already big. All right? So I don't need to get any bigger and grow anymore. Um, so, uh, but when you look um, at the different protein requirements, when you think about those young chicks, it's going to be a lot higher. So you're looking at that 21 to 23% protein, um, which you're going to typically find in your starter grower feeds, okay? Um, so that 20 to 23% uh, protein, um, and there are different feeds that you can find, uh, but before they start laying eggs, they need to be on a starter or starter grower. Okay, starter or starter grower. And the reason for that is, do you think some of the feeds have different stuff in them? Uh -huh. Alright, so in the laying feed, they have a whole lot more calcium. Calcium can actually be detrimental to the kidneys of these young birds. They just can't process that much calcium yet. So it's important when you've got different stages of birds in the same area, uh, that those young birds are not eating those laying pellets, uh, or that laying mash. Okay? Uh, because those birds are just not ready for that amount of calcium. So um, on your finisher, um, so that that is more with broilers. So if you're if you've got some birds that have really done well growing, uh, and they still got say another week to go uh, before it's time for processing, you put them on a finisher where they don't have quite as much um, protein available. Um, as far as um, uh, pullets go. So, like I said, you're going to change their diet when they start laying eggs. When they start laying eggs. So that's when they move over to um, a layer. So the layer is going to have about 3% uh, calcium. You can also add a calcium supplement. So a calcium supplement can come uh, in the form of like uh, oyster shells, um, some type of grit, they'll call it. 
Um, so they'll, you can put that in and just let them have the ad lib. They'll come get it when they need it. Um, so, but for the most part, um, chickens, you can. these are what's called complete feeds. Complete feeds. Uh, so they can, they can be in a, in a pen and only eat this feed and they'll be just fine. Um, so anything you add or take away changes the diet on this. So that's one thing to think about. Um, and for me, I personally love to see my chickens go out in the yard and peck around and do things that chickens do. I mean, why have them if they're not going to get to do like a chicken, right? Um, but they do, that does change their diet. So you've got to think about that if, if peak production is important to you. Because what is in grass? Tons of fiber. That's why I love a cow. She can walk around in America and eat grass turned into beef. Um, so that's, that's great. Chickens can eat fiber too, but it kind of changes what you're feeding. Just like us, if we're eating a steak um, and we're also eating a salad, well, that's not just a steak anymore. Okay. Um, so if they're out foraging, eating bugs, they're changing the protein in their diet. So those are just some things to think about when you think about the feed. Okay. Um, yes. Is there some hot? So that's when you're going to have to start. Uh, mixing your own. Um, and so you can mix some of the feeds. Um, one of the funniest feeds is the fighting rooster feed. All right, so it's going to be upwards of 40% protein. You know, that's the athlete of the chicken. It's not saying that you know that's legal, uh, but um, so that's kind of the athletic bird. You know, so it has a higher protein, and you can mix it um, with like the starter grower that's like a 20%, and you can get a, upwards of a 28 to 30% protein feed. Um, so you can get a higher protein feed to feed if you're going to, you know, by mixing. You can also use some corn and soy meal, you know, and mix it and kind of get your own diet. Um, and so if you know you're going to have a lot of extra fiber, then you'd have to up the protein. I've heard somebody talk about feeding them um, their chicken cat food, like canned cat food. So the thing with canned cat food is it's really high in fat. Um, so you can you can feed that. Just know that it has a lot of fat content. Um, so which is fine if they're really productive and they're going to have a lot of fiber. But if they kind of just eat the cat food and don't do anything else, they're probably going to lay a lot of fat on um, because those cat foods are about thirty percent fat. So that's just kind of something to remember. Yes. Well, mocking in the wintertime, I changed it up and said to keep the layer pellets in the wintertime. Yeah, so uh, you can mix and use some turkey pulp um, feed. It's higher protein. Um, sometimes in the wintertime, you actually want a higher energy. Um, so they don't, they're not required to put energy on feed bags, um, but um, the turkey pulp is a little higher energy. So sometimes this time of year your, your birds are molting um, and so they need more energy when they're going through like things like molt. Um, so those feeds can be okay, but if they're in if they're laying, you probably want to make sure and check that calcium. Um, so if the calcium's not at least three percent, then you gotta add in a calcium supplement. Some kind of um, like a um, um, calcium bicarbonate uh, tums are really good at that. <laughs> For heartburn, uh, but you can uh, you can add in the oyster shells, you know, some type of calcium bicarbonate. Is there a benefit to like protein and food? I'm sorry. Is there a benefit to like a fermented food? Is there a benefit to fermented food? Um, not necessarily. Um, for me, and and I'm a traditionalist, I guess, and I'm also a science person. Um, I like feed that comes from a from a reputable company um, when I'm buying feed because. Uh, there are some smaller companies that don't move their feed as much. They won't be as fresh. Uh, the, the key to feed is freshness. Um, and then obviously ingredients. Um, I personally like going with a, a more reputable company. You don't see the recalls um, on their feed like you do with some of the other kind of niche type. Um, if you're going to go with um, a special type of production, like organic, um, or all natural or one of those, then those ingredients have to be a certain thing. Um, we don't have as many organic ingredients around here, um, but you might be able to order those in. They're just going to be pretty expensive. Um, you know, so there are some of those kind of specialty feeds, uh, but for me, I like the ones that come from a research-based uh, company. So. Is there a benefit to a condition? 
Benefit to what? A conditioner. Conditional? Conditioner. A conditioner? Yeah. Yeah. Um. So it's is it went through a process? Oh, I see. So it's so it, it's all about the nutrient content. Um, so corn, a lot of people have the idea that if if it's uh, uh, if it's not cracked, then it, they don't get the same amount of nutrients out of it. That's actually not true. Um, so they're still going to get because they're the way their intestines are made, they're still going to break that up. Um, and so even if you see a whole kernel come out the back end, they've got the good out of it. Um, so, um, you know, if they're going to be able to maybe digest it a little faster if it's already been cracked. Um, but as far as nutritional value, it's not going to change all that much. Um, so they, they might eat it better if it's, if it's been in a crumble. Um, but what you get into is they'll sort it's kind of like me. If I see M and M's, a carrot, and uh, you know a piece of lettuce, I'm gonna get all those M and M's. Um, so if they if they get uh, particle size differences, they'll actually do some sorting and only eat what they want. So that's why I like the pelleted feed because it's all been uh, in a mash and then it's been pelleted. So they're gonna eat all of it. So that's kind of one of the things that you might see on different types of processing of those feeds. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so, so I'm throw that in there because you're gonna be something I don't need to. No, it's fine. Okay. As a snack. Uh, yeah, it's not like the night yeah. before. It's kinda like me. I can't eat a Snickers every day. I understand. Alright, so you can and, and, and I love to feed them grated carrots, mealworms, you know, that's what makes them like me. Um so um, that's okay for snacks and to get them a little friendly. Um as far as you know, an anthelmintic when it, when it comes to some of those uh, different herbs or spices, um, mostly what it does is it, it changes that gut wall because most of your parasites are actually attaching to the, to the gut wall. Um, and so what it does is it kind of irritates that gut wall and has them release. Um, but the egg, they're going to come right back. It's not going to have 